I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for um, my administrative law class about Whitman versus American Trucking Associations Incorporated, a US Supreme Court case from 2001. This is actually part two of my videos about this case. And here we're gonna be talking about the part of the opinion that addressed cost benefit analysis by agencies. And so this is actually, if you're looking at the majority opinion, this is section two of the majority opinion. I have another video that hopefully you watched that's about the non-delegation part of the case, which is the more famous part of the case. And in fact, some case books cut out this whole section about cost benefit analysis, but it's actually rather important. It's an important part of what administrative agencies do day to day. So it's worth taking a look at. So let's take a look and see what the court did or what happened. So um, part two of the Whitman opinion is about the agency considering implementation costs when setting certain air pollution standards. Our bottom line here is that the court says the statute does not allow the agency to consider implementation costs at all in setting air pollution standards. So if you've ever heard people who are kind of anti-regulation complain, you know, these government bureaucrats never think about how much this is going to cost or how what a burden this is for businesses. That's actually not true, right? The agencies do that. We talk in another part of the course about executive orders that require the agencies to engage in a lot of cost benefit analysis. And there's a lot of times where statutes require agencies to do serious consideration of the implementation costs. There's other situations where the agency would be perfectly happy to, but their statute Congress has actually forbid them to think about the costs when they're making certain safety regulations. In other words, they want them to just think about what is the safest rule possible um, or, or safest regulation that they can make to protect the public instead of um, uh, thinking about the economic effects. So let's look at this case where the court talks about why we're going the way we are. And just as a by way of background, when agencies engage in cost benefit analysis, which is actually a huge part of what um, uh, government regulation is, when we talk about the cost, we're talking about the cost of compliance or implementation for proposed regulations. So this could be, let's say, an industry, and they may have to upgrade their equipment, get new equipment, sometimes very expensive equipment, or install new filters in their HVAC system or on their smokestacks or tailpipes uh, on vehicles and so forth. Or take new safety measures, or maybe even eliminate certain product lines or eliminate um, some of the ingredients that they've been using or raw materials that they've been using. And all of this can spell loss of profits, right? And uh, for the uh, for those who comply, uh, not always, right? But it, as a, it generally, when we talk about the rules are going to have a cost and everybody knows that, but there, and in some ways, this is the cost of, of implementation are the least controversial part of cost benefit analysis. Uh, the, on, we're still going to bring in economists uh, from each side experts to argue about how, how much the equipment actually costs and how extensive the changes will be made. And definitely we're going to argue about how this th affects things like um, competitiveness and the world uh, markets or the time value of money, right? Is this all, or do, should we count up this cost in today's dollars or future estimate the value of future dollars since agencies, uh, the regulated industry will have to comply not just today, but going forward. And so there can be some disagreement about how to assess the future value of these costs or um, estimate exactly how it's going to affect profits and market share. And the flip side of this that we compare it against is the benefits. And here, this is the simpler one to explain, but the much more complicated and controversial one in practice. And that is the value of the statistical lives saved. So first of all, even calculating the statistical life saved is statistics, right? So this is, um, we're not just saying that this and this and this person might not have died, but instead, sometimes we're talking about something that really just makes you sick. It doesn't actually literally kill people, but it takes years off of your life. And a statistician or a, pub, a public health 
person can still translate that into a statistical life saved. So remember, this is complex and mathematical and sometimes speculative. I'm recording this in video in the fall of 2020 uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. And if you look back on the last year, you may remember back last spring, there were uh, different models being put out by experts about how many fatalities we were expecting um, from the pandemic. <clears throat> and sometimes those varied significantly based on certain assumptions, right? And so, and uh, uh, the public was, became acquainted with the idea that um, experts could disagree and even experts could change their own minds about how many people, whether it was going to be a few thousand people would die or a few hundred thousand or several million people were going to die by the end of the year or within a year and a half and so forth. So this is, uh, again, high order math and there is room for disagreement. The other thing to keep in mind that's controversial here is how do we decide how much each of those statistical lives is worth? How do we set a dollar value on a life, in other words? And of course, there's gonna be some philosophical objections to setting any value on life, but we have to compare it with these compliance costs. So if it costs a billion dollars for an industry to comply with a new regulation, the industry is gonna say, you better save a billion dollars worth of lives, right? And so it is one life worth a hundred billion dollars. And so there has been a lot of controversy, as you can imagine, over the years about how to calculate the dollar value for a human life. Now, don't get me wrong, American juries do this every day, right? Five days a week um, in wrongful death actions, they calculate how much, uh, uh, what the damages should be in a wrongful death case. And those come back at a few million dollars, maybe six million dollars is the last average I saw for wrongful death verdicts in the United States. Um, for many years, a number of the federal agencies were just using a nice round number of $10 million was what the dollar value that they would set on, on human lives. And then there were other regulations where they didn't really think about it. And so instead, people would reverse engineer, scholars would later look at the compliance costs and the statistical lives saved and say, look, you valued these lives a lot more. A third, yet another way to <clears throat> possibly come up with a dollar value for human lives that economists have proposed, some economists have proposed, is to look at the wage premium that workers uh, command for uh, high risk jobs. So if there's a certain a 10% chance that you're going to be killed on, on a dangerous job, let's say working on an oil rig or uh, working on an oil rig in Iraq, right? And or a war torn country. Um, and, and then how much higher the wages that people have to, they have to pay to get workers to do that compared to in a safe location where that risk isn't, um, uh, doesn't apply. And when we look at what people demand in terms of a wage premium for the risking their lives, <clears throat> taking a certain uh, uh, chance of death, we actually, it's a much lower than the jury verdicts or the agencies have been using. So again, there's different ways to do this and there's no right answer, but you should be aware that this is a, an issue with administrative law and regulation that doesn't go away. How do we calculate the compliance costs and how do we calculate the benefits um, that we're going to compare it to? Now, for this case, the Clean Air Act in 109B1, the court says, tells the EPA to set primary ambient air quality standards, the attainment of and maintenance of which are requisite to protect the public health with an adequate margin of safety. That's in, I put that in bold. Scalia, who writes the majority opinions, follows that with, one would have thought it was fairly clear that this text does not permit the EPA to consider costs in setting standards. And the trucking industry actually was asking for that in their case. They were saying, wait, the EPA should have to think about how much this is gonna put us out of business, right? This is gonna force all the trucking companies to go into bankruptcy. They should have to think about that and moderate their uh, um, pollution standards a little bit so that it doesn't um, break the bank for us. And Scalia says, look at the text. It doesn't allow the agency to offset this with the concerns about economics. 
the court also has some other reasons that I think are actually kind of clever. Um, they, they look at the legislative history a little bit, which is unusual for Justice Scalia, and says Congress studied the implementation costs formally. They commissioned a formal study before they enacted the Clean Air Act. So Congress did this on their own. There was no reason for them to delegate to the EPA to study the implementation costs of these regulations when Congress did it before they even passed the statute. Um, he also notes uh, several other sections of the Clean Air Act that expressly direct the EPA to consider costs for regulations under those provisions. And the argument here is that if the statute specifies it in one area and then doesn't here, that it implies that Congress it intended for them not to, because Congress certainly knows how to tell the EPA to consider costs, implementation costs, when they want to, because they do it in other places in the same statute. This is an interesting statutory interpretation question of is, if the statute says something in other places and doesn't say it here, is that omission intentional? And the court here infers it is, and here's their quote. We have therefore refused to find implicit in ambiguous sections of the Clean Air Act an authorization to consider costs that have elsewhere, that when it's elsewhere and so often been expressly granted. He finally notes that the, uh, Clean Air Act says states should prepare state implementation plans and get EPA approval. And these state implementation plans do include consideration of, of cost. So if um, Kentucky or Virginia or um, Texas, when they're making their state implementation plan, they can decide um, how they're going to get their ambient air in compliance and negotiate with different companies. Okay, if you could reduce this pollution, um, we could give you a break on this other one and can look at their costs. And so in, there's something here about federalism and states' rights in terms of turning the cost-benefit analysis over to the states um, and with the idea that the local control, they're more likely to have a better assessment of the costs. So here's our quote from the opinion. It is to the states that the Clean Air Act assigns initial and primary responsibility for deciding what emissions reductions will be required from which sources. In other words, states consider the costs, not the EPA. Okay, that concludes our second video about Whitman versus American Trucking Associations. Again, this one was just about part two of the majority opinion, which in the cost benefit analysis section where they said the EPA actually isn't allowed to consider costs when they make these particular regulations because of the statute. And there's another video where we talk about the non-delegation is issue, which is the more famous part of the case.